is uh, something that just surprised the whole world. It's a big challenge to the existence of Europe and to the history of Europe. The only war we are at at this moment is the war against the pandemics. Decretar el estado de alarma en toda España. But we will continue to do everything. Good morning, uh, evening, or afternoon, everyone, depends on where you're based. Uh, here we got uh, people from London, from New York City. Uh, Tom, where are you based? In New York? I'm in New York as well. And uh, me in Madrid, so uh, we cover several time zones. Thank you uh, too much, uh, guys, for joining this uh, project, this forward, and thank you very much for your support. This is the fourth session after uh, trade shows and mice segment. After um, we have been talking about DMOs, we have been talking about uh, trade shows, and this is the third or maybe the fourth. Oh, marketing, marketing too. So this is the fourth uh, session. We got we got hospitality and luxury travel. The next probably uh, this this uh, these days too, but um, well, I want I will introduce to Rafat. This is the founder and CEO of Skiff. Uh, Skiff is probably one of the most relevant um, travel media in in global globally actually, and uh, he's uh, well surrounded by one of the members of a skip and, and Rosie member of a skip too and uh, well I will let you alone talking about the role of uh, the travel media and in this mm -hmm. crisis this is huge and this is um, an also topic to, to talk to but uh, yeah. let me uh, kindly remember to all the watchers and users of this session please uh, make donations to UNICEF this is the NGO of uh, of this session. You can click on the on the icon just beside the video, and uh, please make your best. Okay, Rafat, um, it's all yours. Okay, all right. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so uh, my name is Rafat Ali. I'm the CEO and founder of Skifts, and I'm joined by two of our uh, team members, Tom Lowry, who's the editor-in-chief of Skift, and Rosie Spinks, who's the global tourism reporter for Skift. Um, all um, three of us have a long history in media, have a, have, a, have a larger understanding of media's role in the larger world. And uh, we'll, for the next uh, 30 minutes or so, we're going to focus on the role of, of media that's covering travel. So that includes uh, mainstream media that has been looking at travel over the last few months, and then the role of travel media and the role of Skift. Um, so, uh, you know, we at Skift uh, started covering uh, what was happening in Wuhan, China, pretty early, I would say mid-January. Uh, this is when uh, the first lockdown started to happen in China. And uh, obviously the news reports coming out of there, Chinese travelers have been a, the biggest force in the global business of travel for the last 10 years. And so every destination, every brand in travel have been particularly attuned to Chinese travelers and where they're going. So if Chinese travelers started to dry out then, which, it, which they did, um, the, the world of, of travel media, especially companies like us, uh, began to cover this heavily back then. 
And obviously a lot has happened in those, in those last few months. So we'll discuss some, some of that. Uh, we will discuss the, the role of larger media. So historically, and this is, Skift has been around now for uh, eight years almost. And one of the things that we've talked from the start is the, the role of travel in the larger world is not recognized. It is the biggest global force. It's the biggest globalization engine. Uh, it is um, certainly um, how the world moves, not just humans, but also um, cargo as well. And yet it doesn't get addressed at the policy level, at the local level, state level, national level, international level, with the heft that it should have. And so ironically, one of the things that we've been writing about, and I wrote an essay about this um, a few weeks ago, uh, that the world is now realizing that travel is the most consequential sector in the world by the fact that the world is not traveling. And so, you know, in the deafening silence of a grounded planet, finally the world realizes that travel is uh, an extremely important sector. So uh, I want to bring in Tom and Rosie. Um, from sort of early on your thoughts and how media started looking at this to now, let's let's focus first on mainstream media. Um, and, you know, mainstream media only wakes up about travel whenever there's some shit show going on. I don't know if we're supposed to use that word, by the way, but we'll use it anyway. Um, and, you know, cruises, whether, you know, obviously every time something bad happens with cruises, the media wakes up, the mainstream media, and starts covering it, and suddenly they discover that there's travel industry. Well, Robert, yeah, it's interesting. Go ahead, Go ahead, Tom. Okay, it's interesting because uh, we were saying today how the, the mainstream coverage has almost now moved on away from travel because this has affected, you know, everything in the world, the entire economy. But in the early days of the crisis, as you said, mid to late January, um, all of a sudden the travel industry was an industry that was being covered holistically and not in this sort of fragmented way that, you know, business journalism often covers it, a story about hotels, a story about airlines, a story about crews. So um, certainly for us who who do this all, all day long, all week long, it was um, it was sort of nice to be out ahead of it a little bit in a way that um, you can be when you <laughs> when you're a specialist publication. I also feel like uh, mainstream travel media coverage, even prior to the, this crisis, never really kind of understood the business side of travel. And I think that was just, uh, it's been a mistake and that it's crucial now to be able to have that understanding because of the impact that that has on the businesses, which ultimately has impact on the consumers. So, um, so I think that's a huge advantage for a publication like ours, Skift, uh, that we just so are keenly smart on the business side of, of travel. Yeah, I think, you may remember this, Tom. Uh, Rosie was probably too young for this, but when 9-11 happened after that, remember there was this whole discussion about how foreign bureaus for most of the media had gone away, or at least were early stages. I mean, this was 20 years ago. Imagine what, what it is now. But like, how do you cover Middle East when you didn't have anybody left there? Mm -hmm. And um, travel uh, over the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years, the travel... Uh, sections for most of the newspapers had gone away for most of the major newspapers, except for well, actually for all the smaller and the, and the midsize, except for some exceptions like New York Times, etc. And so even people who are covering travel from a leisure perspective had basically gone away. Yeah, and those sections, um, you know, were those sections that did still exist, do still exist, are so consumer focused that they almost aren't really, it's not, it doesn't feel quite right to have this kind of coverage in the New York Times travel section. Although I have noticed that they, they have gone down that route a little bit more in the travel section of, obviously they can't tell people where to go anymore because <laughs> it's not relevant. Um, and they, they've definitely sort of branched out into more kind of newsy coverage in the travel section, which I think is really interesting. And the other, go ahead, Tom. I mean, I also feel like the that mainstream travel media was caught totally flat-footed by this, and and I, and you can see it now in their continuing coverage. It's not, you know, they're still trying to push out sort of tourism promotion kind of stories, just slightly framing it around the coronavirus, like, you know, stay tuned, this will be back, come here. You know, it's it feels it feels a little bit off to me. Yeah, and 
you know, we've talked about this for years, is that the coverage of business or travel, I mean, the fact that pretty much no major media today has a dedicated travel business reporter, not even a single one, Wall Street Journal, this is the most preeminent business publication uh, in the world, certainly one of the one of the one of the top two or three uh, did not have a single business reporter before this dedicated covering. They used to have hospitality, even that was gone. Uh, New York Times, they used to have aviation reporter seven years ago, uh, doesn't have anybody dedicated to it now. Um, obviously, they're now all scrambling and they say it's just business or we'll cover it from our business angle. But really, nobody had, uh, except for maybe Bloomberg and Reuters, those are wire wire services, didn't really have mainstream business reporters covering travel on any sort of regularity. Airlines probably had the most just because airlines tend to be a very high profile sector, but hospitality and tourism, I mean, tourism probably comes the lowest of totem pole in terms of business coverage, uh, which is obviously a huge, huge disservice to covering travel, um, you know, the travel agents, the tour operators, cruises obviously comes on and off when some something bad happens. Uh, in media, no one who's covering cruise actually, very few people who cover cruise actually understand how that industry works, which essentially makes that coverage meaningless or useless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that in general, if the silver lining of, of some more mature coverage of the travel industry and what it means to the world um, happens as, as a result of this, I think that will be a good thing to come. Obviously, you know, us as a company um, is a source for a lot of the mainstream media that looks at the, the world of travel. And so hopefully that's a, that's a, that's a good part. So let's talk about the role of um, travel media itself. I know we touched a little bit on, um, you know, that the consumer travel media part, which is, uh, you know, New York Times reporters or CNN reporters that cover travel. Um, and we're talking international, so let's say Guardian as well and other places in the world that cover travel. What seems to have happened, a lot of it has been outsourced to freelancers. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just that nobody has a dedicated focus on anything in travel. And they've become certainly not physical sections in the newspapers anymore. They're obviously digital and there's no consistency of coverage on anything. If any of you want to tackle that. Yeah, I was just going to say quickly, um, you know, you're sa- you were saying there's sort of a, a silver lining, if you will, about the travel industry being covered better as a result of this. I feel like the litmus test for that will be uh, when you tell someone you're a journalist and, and they say, what do you write about? And you say, you write about travel. The assumption is always, oh, so you review hotels and go to resorts and my job couldn't be further from that. So (laughs) my answer is often like, well, no, we write about, you know, human trafficking, pollution on cruise ships, (laughs) those kinds of things. So maybe that, maybe this uh, crisis will change that. Um, But so, so your question was, sorry, can you repeat? Mainstream, mainstream travel media and whether it's newspapers or magazines. I mean, the, we can talk about travel magazines and travel magazines have been decimated pre-coronavirus, not because of coronavirus. In general, right. many travel magazines have closed down. A lot of them have not made the leap to digital travel guidebooks. You can sort of put in the same um, bucket as well that they haven't made the leap online. Even the most well-known brands like Lonely Planet and others haven't necessarily being a huge success online beyond a certain point. And so um, I well, wonder I, what I think that is, Robert. I mean, is it that people are just more, there's Google search now and people can do their own. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like they say, like, how do you, like, uh, what's the world's biggest travel inspiration engine? Well, it's called Google because mm-hmm. you start with that. It's, it's all the intent is sent to Google. Mm-hmm. And um, in a, in a sector where people only dream about travel or start or do travel a couple of times, two, three times a year, if that, because a lot, a large majority of planet doesn't can't afford to travel. Um, the, the, um, the need to go back to these sites, for instance, in a digital is less and less, which means that, you know, unfortunately digital works on a basis of frequency and you need to have enough frequency of usage through the year 
for them to make any money from advertising, from subscriptions for, you know, in any possible way. So it's been, and we've written about that from the start, it's like travel media has never been able to break through on the internet. Mm-hmm. So much less in an era where um, the traffic to their sites last night uh, at 12, by the way, in the night I was looking at similar web, which looks at traffic to different sites. And I put, I put in booking.com, TripAdvisor, Expedia, Lonely Planet, and a couple of others. And their traffic in March is basically this. So these are the biggest of biggest sites in travel. Imagine travel media, which is much smaller. These sites are much smaller, Conan as Traveler, Travel and Leisure, all these others. They're trying to do the jobs that they, they can, social media, et cetera, being a, being, a, being a more pertinent outlet for them. But, but it's, it's, I'm sure, is hard for them. Yeah, I also think there's a there's a tension there and uh, for those publications that maybe we don't have, which is that in a, in a way they, they are sort of cheerleaders in a sense for travel and the travel industry. And it's it's really hard to cover an industry properly if you have that vantage point. Um, you know, it's part of the reason I came to work at Skift because I, I knew from reading it that it, it wasn't that. Um, so I think it, you know, just from a basic reporting standpoint, you, uh, you can't sort of be coming, starting from a, a standpoint of travel is great, tra- more travel, everyone should travel. Um, and it's not that we, we don't like travel here at Skift, we do, but, um, we don't, we don't come from a default position of more and more travel, better, 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 you know, ad nauseum. And I think, I think sometimes the specialist travel publications I sense that they do come from that mindset, if that makes sense. Right. And I don't know how going forward they plan coverage, especially as a lot of these are sort of monthly magazines. Um, and the story is just moving so fast. Like, how do you plan for the June issue of Condé Nast Traveler? I mean, it's just like, you know, I'm, I do not envy those editors having to come up yeah. with that. Walk out of your house, travel edition. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that'll be the cover, I think, for Carnest Traveler. Right. <laughs> Can you walk out of the house and walk to the grocery store without having yeah. to worry about too many things? Is the form of travel? I think that um, I think you know the the way that they will probably probably pivot is to start covering local travel a lot more seriously. You know, I think we we have talked about how potentially drive travel drive. Driving distance travel, I forget what the technical term for that is. Road trips. Road trips, yeah. Um, will definitely have some sort of a resurgence uh, because I think people want personal control and you know, getting into your car and going to some place and traveling with your own cleaning, cleaning supplies, um, unfortunately, is a fact of life. So I think um, local travel and maybe even local travel magazines Mm. Remember, like, you know, LA has its own local magazine of some sort in New York and Hamptons has their own and I'm sure equivalents in, in Europe and other parts of the world. Those local either city destination things or local magazines will probably have a better sense of covering it. Um, and I'm sure this is what travel media in general Travel magazines in general are trying to figure out is, of course, there are no newsstands open, so they have zero newsstand sales. Uh, they have subscriptions, most of them print subscriptions, and then they're covering it online. And we've looked and made some fun of the tone deafness of, you know, say, some travel magazine on Twitter and like talking about. Um, you know, random travel stuff as opposed to what's happening in travel now. And I'm sure that's a balance that they're trying to figure out. I know why they're doing it, which is trying to counter program against doom and gloom. Right. But um, uh, I think that the, the you know, the, it's, it's a big challenge and certainly we avoid some of those challenges because we figure we focus on the business of travel. We have our own challenges, which we'll talk about in a minute, but um, it will, I think because advertising is going to dry up, none of the consumer magazines or publications had any chance at having a subscription model to begin with. It's very hard. These are consumer publications that don't really have a must-read element to them. So 
a lot of media is looking at pivoting to subscriptions. It doesn't really work in travel. I don't know if any of you have any thoughts on that. Uh, in, in terms of the consumer consumer travel, yeah, no, it's I'm a I'm a print subscriber to several travel magazines, just you know because you know I want to see what what they're doing and what and uh, you know the size of the magazines just in the over the years has just shrunk incredibly, so the advertising base is going away. I I, I really don't see you know magazines like Afar, or Travel and Leisure, or Condé Nast Travel, or National Geographic Travel, which I'm not even sure is around anymore. Yeah, I think it shut down maybe. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think there's going to be a shakeout with some of those. Um, you know, maybe one will survive. Um, but again, you know, um, you know, people are going to be out of work. They're not going to have money to pay for subscriptions. Um, and I'm sure those aren't considered essential subscriptions to anyone. Yeah, and then the reality is that all of them were traveled from before. It's not like this was the one. This was the one moment they've yeah. been traveled for a while. Travel Channel doesn't can't get people to watch Travel Channel. And before, I mean, before all this, there was every other person on Instagram is a travel writer. So why would you pay? You know, with probably more content and more pictures and more even interactive elements than a magazine, like you know. Uh, like those ones you just named could could compete with. So uh, the idea to me that one would look at a monthly magazine for travel inspiration is is pretty far off. <laughs> far Rosie, off let's ask a question that uh, you just touched on, which is uh, which is influencers and Instagram influencers have become a a big force in different parts of the world. Uh, travel, uh, you could argue, uh, but at least they had big uh, audiences, or at least large number of followers. I don't know if the followers translate into an actual audience, but there have been stories early on. I think they've, they've stopped now. Um, the effects of, uh, of this crisis on travel influencers, which also count as media. So what do you think yeah. has happened and what do you think will happen? I mean, basically they, they don't, you know, they can't go to Coachella. They can't go to the things, the deals they had set up with their, with their brands and their, their partnerships. So they can't deliver on a lot of the content they had in the pipeline. Um, and these people, these influencers, their job is to look aspirational and live lives that other people wish they were living. And there's only so much of that you can do when you're, um, you know, there's only so much sourdough bread you can bake uh, and post on Instagram on lockdown. So I think that, you know, that's obviously a huge challenge. There's also been a sort of, that was kind of the storyline in, in, you know, late February, early March. I, I read a story by Taylor Lorenz who covers influencer and internet culture for the New York Times really well. And there's sort of this now subset of them who have, you know, left New York City, let's say, to go to a family's house of state or go elsewhere. And they're broadcasting that journey because they have to share and they always share. But that's actually quite an irresponsible thing to do. So they're they're in this space of they can't they can't just go and, and do whatever they want and stay with their family without broadcasting it because they need they need to feed the beast. But um, it's quite a tricky ethical situation for a lot of them. There's been a lot of backlash of these influencers, you know, getting in the car and driving down to Florida and turning content, making content out of it when, you know, the CDC says you should not be doing that. Let me ask you this, Rosie. Does, when, when travel does bounce back or there's some sense of recovery, do the influencers have – do they become irrelevant or is there some kind of new relevant role for them to play in the rebound of travel? Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I'm sure they'll play a role in it. I was, I was really, I have this internal metric in my head. I've probably never said out loud, which is like, you know, when a story is really big or really bad, when you can't go on Instagram without seeing it in like every post or, you know, when the random style blogger you follow is talking about COVID-19, like <laughs> it's, it's pretty <laughs> inescapable. Um, and so I, I noticed that happening, you know, weeks ago now um, and haven't really seen that. Obviously, that hasn't changed since. So I, I wonder if there will be a little bit more of a humility to it when when everything goes back to normal. And, um, you know, I, I've sort of thought this was coming, you know, in not now, but a long time off. But this idea that maybe it's not great to be jetting off to another country on a whim every you know every other week like maybe you should travel a little more intentionally and maybe you shouldn't take every single free paid opportunity you're you're given um because it's just it's it kind of cheapens it and it's obviously irresponsible from a 
climate perspective. So I wouldn't be surprised. I do think it will return, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was slightly different, a slightly different tone. Also, we've been covering this tension about climate change and travel and what does it mean for uh, to have a response, like travel's responsibility to the world. This is a theme that skipped for the last year. In, in fact, gets enhanced even more now. And, um, you know, climate change meets pandemic. Yeah. Uh, and what does that mean for the travel industry? What does that mean then for the coverage of travel from mainstream media to, all the way down to specialists like us uh, is, is a very interesting dynamic I think that will play out I mean we did a piece uh, was it Andrew who wrote this piece on when over tourism meets climate change yeah. that was uh, not that long ago mm-hmm. and obviously over tourism for now as a um, as a debate has died down but that's only headlines underlying it are the structural issues in travel that don't get solved because there's no travelers right. Um I think those structural issues will need to be need to be resolved. You know, pollution in general, um, the footprint of travel, um, all types of other issues that will continue to be discussed, certainly by us and right. others as well. I, I also feel like, all right, the reality is that we're going to be covering a lot of crippled companies, but you know, one of our missions at Skift is to hold travel accountable, and I, I don't think that we pull back on any of that when it comes to these issues of. Um, you know, climate change and what you're doing to be more green. Um, I just think that, you know, we have to keep doing what we've done all along at Skift. Yeah. So So speaking of which, let's talk about some of the trade media and obviously what we've been doing. And, and, you know, one of the things that I've had to explain many times uh, over the last few weeks is our role and responsibility to the travel industry. We were never boosters of the travel industry in the best of times. And even in the worst of times, um, the right accountable journalism is not to be the booster of the industry, however much the industry is hurting. Um, we, you know, we may not put banner headlines on layoffs that are happening because that is insensitive in general. Like we're not going to shout exclusive. Guess what? This company laid off 10,000 people. Everybody is. Um, and so there's a little bit of that element, but beyond that, our role uh, is to continue to be a, to hold the industry accountable and uh, talk about the business of travel in, in a in a big picture way. What does the world look like from here? How has the response been from companies? Did they do the right thing on customer service? Uh, you know that certainly was one of the first things that we started covering is how our companies responding in terms of cancellations, whether it's uh, happening in events, whether it's happening in airlines, whether it's happening in hotels or or anything else, and then you know, it looked like in the end, especially airlines uh, had to do the right thing, which is cancel. Um, now the government, especially the U.S. government, has clamped down and said that you have to do a refund as opposed to future vouchers. I think some of the other airlines, maybe British Airways, I think is in this bucket where they're not canceling but giving future vouchers uh, as well. So, uh, you know, our role um, beyond just the crazy crazy speed of headlines that that were coming at us for the last month uh, even that that headlines have the volume of headlines have sort of lessened but um, uh, but I think now it's the stories of what happens from here that we'll have to cover yeah and I also think there's a there's part of that coverage is you know there's kind of this big reset that's happened and a lot of industries, sectors of travel, we wrote a story about this today with tourism marketing, they have this kind of unenviable, but, you know, sort of um, undeniable, undeniable opportunity to look at the way they've been doing things and what hasn't been working and, you know, how they can rebuild from here. And I think I really have this sense that the travel industry was due for that. Like there was a, there was a kind of hubris, I think, from the last 10 years of just travel, travel, travel. Everyone loves to travel. It's never going to end. And I remember being at ILTM in December, which is the big luxury travel show in Cannes, and like viscerally feeling that sort of excess that this is like, these people really think this isn't going to (laughs) end. And I wrote a piece at that time that it it sort of would end because of climate change. You know, never in a million years would I imagine it would end in three months from a pandemic. But I, I think, and I hope that the industry will 
will re- return in a, a little bit of a little bit more of a conscious way. And I think part of our job is to is to cover that and and point out when you know things are are quickly defaulting back into business as usual as soon as people are spending money and and point those kinds of things out. And that's one of the things I think I've been most proud of in terms of our coverage is that you know it's so easy to cover the dire state of, of everything and sort of get down in the black hole of this. But I think what Skip has done really well is cover how this crisis is presenting or will present opportunities for travel. Uh, and I think we've done that really well and effective. Um, I also feel like, you know, editors like to, to throw out the word essential, that our coverage is essential. Uh, and a lot of times that's just bullshit. But I feel like that Skift has always uh, had the goal of being essential to our readers. And now with this crisis uh, and the addition of the live blog, which was Rafat's idea, uh, as well as, you know, a daily podcast to promote our coverage and just the sort of round the clock coverage. We really are, uh, I'll say this with without humility, that we've done the best coverage in terms of travel and in a certain sector of the economy, global economy, I'll even go that far, uh, than our competitors for sure. Yeah, and uh, I think I'll uh, probably add to this and, and we, we may have to end it here. Um, on the reco- the shape of the recovery. So there's a lot of debate on what the shape of the recovery is going to look like, when the- will this end. And uh, one of the things that I got a little bit of controversy posting on social media, uh, I think two weeks ago, uh, and now it's completely clear, is that there's no V-shaped recovery that will happen in the, in the-, in the world, forget travel. If the world isn't shit, travel isn't shit. That's just, obviously we know that. So this whole raw rhizome from some travel industry industry consultants and even some travel industry folks is that we're all sitting in our in our houses and locked in our houses for for a few weeks and months and we're all ready to just go back out and it's all going to be okay let's just hold on for a few weeks or a few months it's not going to be the case it's increasingly clear as we sit here today at at best it's going to be sort of a a lazy u-shaped recovery with the with the with the big trough in that in that you um and at worst it could be an l-shaped recovery for a while and i've said this and i said it on linkedin and twitter that i think it's 2025 not recovery as in as in like the travel will be crap for the next five years it just means that for it to go back to even a semblance of pre-coronavirus numbers uh, and it may not ever certain parts of the travel industry is a five-year journey that is true Post nine eleven, it took three years for the numbers to come back to the pre nine eleven numbers from in terms of uh, airline passengers after the after the two thousand eight crisis. It took about two years. This is a whole different level. This is people's millions and maybe potentially hundreds of millions of people's livelihoods destroyed, and um, and I think that uh, travel media, media like us and and other people who are covering travel have an extremely important role to to keep that in mind of travel's place in the world and and have that as the centrality in how they look at the world. So any of you want to have a last word or we can call it quits here? I think that says it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Tom and Rosie. And uh, with that, we'll hand it back to Fabian and the team.